Well, hello, I'm Dr. Rhonda Lair, and up to now, I feel that I've been Miss Ogden Surgical Medical Society, but now I'm very pleased to say I'm just one of the misses because we now have Heather Hillison as um, our president, and you're doing a great job. So happy to work with you, Heather. Um, and I'm here, I'm a psychiatrist at Ogden for 23 years. This organization is very, very near and dear to me. And I'm very happy to announce, uh, to talk about our next speaker, Raymond Zelenskis. And I haven't, I just met him a second ago, so I looked over his bio, which is interesting enough for me to read the whole thing. So after graduating from California State University at Northridge with a BA in biology from the University of Stockholm, with, with the philosophy candidat in organic chemistry, Dr. Zelenskis worked as a clinical microbiologist for 16 years, then commenced graduate study, uh, studies at the University of Southern California. His dissertation addressed policy issues generated by recombinant DNA, um, including the ap applicability of genetic engineering techniques for military and terrorist purposes. After earning a PhD, Dr. Z worked at the U.S. Office of Technology Assessment, from 81 to 82, um, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and the University of Maryland Biotechnology Institute. And he was adjunct professor at the Department of International Health School of Hygiene and Public Health at Johns Hopkins uh, until 1999. And uh, 1994, he worked as an analyst of the United Nations Special Commission on Iraqi Biological Weapons Issue, and he was a member of two biological inspections. In September of 98, Dr. Zelenskis was appointed senior scientist at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, great place to live, my brother's in Carmel. Um, and he was promoted to director of the Chemical and Biological Weapons Nonproliferation Program. Uh, and on October 10th, he was the principal investigator of the Preparedness and Emergency Response Research Center component of the CNS, and it's operated in partnership with the Center for Infectious Disease and Emergency Readiness, Readiness at the School of Public Health, University of California at Berkeley. His research focuses on achieving effective biological arms control, oh, good luck, and the proliferation potential of the former Soviet Union's biological warfare program, also meeting the threat of bioterrorism and improving preparedness and response to biological chemical events. Dr. Zelinska's book, Biological Warfare, Encyclopedia of Bioterrorism Defense was co-edited by Dr. Richard Pilch and Dr. Zelenkis, and um, that, was that will be published in 2011. And he's currently co-authoring a book on the history of the Soviet Biological Warfare Program, which is scheduled to be pres um, published by the Harvard Press in 2012. So he's busy writing, researching, and promoting peace and preparedness. Dr. Zelenkis. And I must say, uh, like most of you, I just uh, finished listening to a very interesting and uh, entertaining uh, presentation by Dr. Crouch. Uh, in, at Monterey County, we have something called the Monterey County Health Education Consortium. And uh, its major job or major responsibilities, every three or four months we put on a symposium Anyway, about uh, five months ago, we also had a prison doc as, as one of our speakers. And that had to do with a very interesting uh, episode of botulism. There was, a botul there was an outbreak of botulism in two California prisons, one in Soledad, which is in Monterey County, and the other one in Riverside County. So he uh, dealt with those issues. And uh, it turned out to be really, really fascinating to uh, prison life. Uh, this had to do, the, the reason, that first of all, they didn't know where the botulism came from, so there was an epidemiological investigation. And it turned out that the prisoners were making this uh, alcoholic drink, I think they call it pruno, and they were, what they did as an ingredient for that, they used potato peels that they were able to steal from the kitchen. And the potato peels had Clostridium botulinum spores on them, which then uh, contaminated the fluid that they used to, uh, to ferment, and that's how they got botulism. But I was listening to Dr. Tubbs again, and I was thinking, you know, if I ever had a responsibility for putting on a conference 
for sure, for sure, I would invite a, pr- a prison doc to, c- to appear right in the middle of it just to enliven things. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about a pretty grim subject, I think. If I can move this thing up. So, uh, as I understand, there's a DVD that has this uh, presentation on it. So I don't want to go through every detail of it. Uh, I, I'll go through, obviously, most of it. Uh, a lot of this you can read yourself, and you can see there's five parts. And, uh, and I'm going to be talking about essentially work that I do. Okay. But, okay, so I'll, I'll speak a little closer to this thing. Or you can read the, uh, the parts of this presentation. And a lot of that has to do with the work that I do at the Monterey Institute. Uh, because we are a preparedness and emergency response research center, working closely with the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. And our, you know, most public health people don't know what a biological or chemical weapon looks like. Uh, so that's what we really bring to the table. Not only do we know what the weapons look like, we know about their limitations. And, their, um, and, their, and, uh, and what they can do. Uh, so that's some of the things that I'll be talking about today. So if nothing, if you come away from this, uh, this lecture or presentation with nothing else, it should be that a biological or chemical weapon is a system. Whenever you read in a newspaper for some ignorant journalist saying that somebody has bacillus and of spores and therefore they have a weapon, that's not it. That's just not true. Uh, you got to have four components before you have a weapon. When I talk to my students, I, I usually tell them, think of the agent as like a bullet, like a lead bullet. A lead bullet by, themself, by itself is not a weapon. It's not until you put it in a cartridge with powder in it, and you put the cartridge into a rifle or a pistol, that it becomes a weapon. And it's the same thing with, uh, with biological weapons. You, of course, have the pathogen, which is the active ingredient. But unless it's a spore, you have to, if you are the developer of a biological weapon, you have to protect the cells or the virus particles because they don't like to live in the open air. So this half time of, a, for example, a Yersinia pestis cell is maybe about four minutes. That's not enough for biological weapons purposes. But when the Soviets weaponized their Yersinia pestis, the half-life of that cell, the, of, the, of the formulated cell, was about 20 minutes, which is plenty long enough for we- biological weapons purposes. But then you have to put your formulation into some sort of container. It could be a munition, in other words, a bomblet or a bomb um, or even a um, missile warhead, um, unless you want to store it for a while, then you need to put it in a different kind of container. But, uh, so that becomes vital too. And then finally, when you're ready to deploy a biological weapon, you have to find some way to bring that, those, that formulated agent to the target population, and that's the dispersal device. And I'm going to be showing some examples of that, so you keep that in mind. But all four of these components have to be present before you actually have a weapon. These are some of the military weapons. As uh, was mentioned, I was an inspector in, in Iraq, so this was their basic bomb. They had 166 biological bombs that would, had payloads of either botulinum toxin, of, uh, uh, of bacillus anthracis, or aflatoxin. And they also had 25 missiles that had those same agents. Uh, this is a U.S. biological bomblet that we manufactured before we closed down our program in 1969. And it had roughly four pounds, it weighed about four pounds, had about, uh, about 4.4 pounds of, uh, of pathogen, and then had a filler in the, in the formulation, and about a half pound of uh, what they call a burster charge, uh, which is an explosive charge that then dispersed the agent uh, when it hit the ground. And here you see Bill Patrick, who was a member of one of our teams and also was a former biological weapons manager uh, in, in the old U.S. program, 
looking at this Iraqi helicopter, trying to figure out if these nozzles were appropriate for distributing biological weapons particles in, in the right size. If it was for agricultural purposes, which they claim it was, then the particles would be more than 100 microns in diameter. But if you're dealing with a biological weapons particle, then you're talking about anywhere between 1 and 10 microns. Uh, so that's what he was checking out. And these indeed turned out to be agricultural helicopters. But when you're dealing with terrorist weapons, that they're quite different. I think you've all seen pictures of this uh, of the envelope that contain a letter and uh, roughly two grams of uh, bacillus and traces spores. Well, this is a weapon. You have the formulation inside. You have the, uh, the munition, which is the envelope. And then you have the person who panics out and disperses the white powder over the room. It's not a very sophisticated weapon, but it certainly worked. Uh, the, um, this, oops, sorry. Uh, this is an umbrella gun that was used by a Bulgarian KGB man to assassinate uh, two, uh, two Bulgarian dissidents, and it's man camouflaged like an umbrella, and what it has inside is an air gun that shoots out a little pellet like this, that uh, then is once inserted in the tissue. Well, this particular one had ricin, so it's nearly not a biological weapon, it's a toxin weapon. The ricin was put into these small holes, and there was a wax that held the ricin intact in, inside the pellet and that would melt at body temperature, 37 degrees centigrade. So uh, this person, um, his name was Markov. He was walking down the street in London. He felt this, somebody pushed something against him. The person said, excuse me, and disappeared. So what has happened is that the assassin had pressed the gun against the thigh of Markov, injected the pellet, and then the ricin was released, and he died after about 24 hours of agony. But the interesting part was that there was a second uh, person, another Bulgarian who was living in Paris, and he said, when he read about this in the newspaper, he said, well, that happened to me too. Uh, so he went to see the doctor, they took x-rays, found the pellet, but what happened there is that maybe he had heavier clothing. The pellet bar barely penetrated the skin, so the temperature never reached 37 degrees, and therefore the wax was still intact, so it, it, he was saved from you know, terrible death. And these, this was used by essentially, something like this was used by the Rajneeshi, which was a religious organization that uh, had, was headquartered in Oregon. And what they did is that they uh, wanted to affect a local uh, election, so they sent their operatives out. And they had um, grown salmonella in agar on agar plates, and they then harvested those salmonella, put it in saline. The saline was put into these bottles, bottles like this, and then the operatives went to 11 salad bars and spread it over the salad bars and 751 people got uh, very, very sick with gastrointestinal illness, of course. Nobody died, fortunately. Uh, so that, that's a terrorist weapon. And Bill Patrick loved to go around. When he, he, he was invited to speak like I'm doing right now, then he'd pull out one of these things and start spraying this white powder all around. And that's a biological weapon. I mean, you have all the four components. So bioterrorism defined, it's a fairly uh, simple definition. So the, the, the catch words here are for political or economic purposes. And you will find that the few examples we have are really criminal acts involving biologicals. Most of them are not done for bioterrorist purposes, but for other, for criminal purposes. And I do think that that's probably going to be the case in the future too. So, for example, a competitor, an industrial competitor wiping, wanting to wipe out another competitor would then sabotage that competitor, that, uh, that producer's uh, whatever the products they have with a biological or chemical agent. Um, and that's not terrorism. That's uh, greed or whatever you want to call it. So uh, my point that I'm just trying to make is that uh, if... We did a survey of bioterrorist attacks since World War II, 
And you can see there, there were 64 cases, but most of them involved, or she was a bi-criminal tax. A lot of them were single, one single person trying to kill another single person. And we had a whole bunch of these uh, terrible cases where we have parents injecting their children with HIV, but those are not really bioterrorist attacks. They, if we, when we looked at the record, we found that there were just four cases since World War II where there were uh, more than 10 people affected by a, by a criminal event. And the first one here was a Japanese doctor who had really jealousy issues and he was professionally jealous who tried to uh, do away with uh, some of his colleagues in the hospital in Japan. And again, you can see that was a foodborne event, 64 victims, nobody died. The Rajneeji, which I just told you about, another foodborne um, attack. Uh, I put in the um, Shinrikyo even though it didn't generate any casualties because it's so indicative of what could happen. The um, Shinrikyo, which is mostly known because of the sarin under uh, attack on the Japanese, on the Tokyo subway system, which did cause a lot of casualties. But the um, Shinrikyo also developed biological weapons based on bacillus and traces and on, uh, on what they thought was botulinum toxin. But they did some horribly bad technical mistakes, which was very fortunate for the Japanese population. For bacillus and traces, they used uh, this, the uh, vaccine strain, the Stern strain, which doesn't cause any pathology. And then the Clostridium botulinum, they got the strain that barely produced uh, botul botulinum toxin. So that didn't work either. And then they had technical problems with dispersal. So they didn't generate any, any casualties whatsoever. But the, uh, the, what we worried about is that some other organization is going to learn from that experience and do it right. Diane Thompson, a lady who worked in a Dallas hospital and who, had a, who was jealous because her boyfriend dumped her and she then baked some, um, some muffins. She stole Shigella from her own, the hospital she worked on, the laboratory in the hospital where she worked on, and then she contaminated the, uh, the muffins with the Shigella and then sent out an email saying, hello everybody, uh, there's these beautiful muffins waiting for you in the coffee room. And then, uh, so 12 people took advantage of that and then suffered gastrointestinal disease. None of them included, of course, her boyfriend. And then, of course, we had the worst case, which is the uh, so-called amerithrax, uh, probably caused by Bruce Ivins, uh, which is the only one that was really an aerosol attack. The other ones were all foodborne. You can see then that the probabilities of, this is terrorism generally, we're not even talking about bioterrorism, uh, the, the probability of somebody being affected by a bioterrorist effect is very, very small. The most victims we have ever had from terrorism oops, uh, is, uh, was because of 9-11, and that was not bioterrorism, chemical, but you can still see what the uh, statistics is. Very, very, very small. And uh, we can go even look at the statistics from another viewpoint, and you can see that, uh, that the worst year ever for the United States in terrorism it was still insignificant as far as public health uh, goes. So uh, how do we try to figure out if there's going to be a bioterrorist event in the future? And this is then the, vol uh, the, the formula that is used commonly in the intelligence community for all kinds of threat assessment. Threat assessments are different than risk assessments. A risk assessment, we usually think of a scientific approach based on data. Threat assessment doesn't have data, so you have to do assessment based a lot on gut feelings. But yet, that's something that has to be done in many cases, especially by, by intelligence agencies. So this is then the, uh, the, the general formula. Uh, so first of all, the target has to be vulnerable. It's obvious. And then the capability has to be there for the adversary to be able to mount the kind of attack that's being considered, in this case a biological attack, and then the leadership 
has to to have the intent to use that kind of weapon. So uh, to to put it in more stark terms, um, there has to be by the prospective terrorist um, an assessment of the target and to find that it. And I'm going to show you a list of targets. Then the scientific technical level of the terrorist group and there's a huge difference between a group like the Anshinrikyo where they had doctors and scientists as members and a redneck group in Oklahoma that uh, you know have people that are barely literate uh, so but the um, what you have to keep in mind for, for, for intelligence purposes it's very good to know whether or not a country or a country or a group has or has not the capability. If they don't have the capability, you just take them off the, the list right away. And then the intent and, uh, of, uh, of it, what is the leadership? What do they want to do? Uh, so based on these factors, then, uh, then the intelligence analysts can come up with some sort of uh, what they think is a reasonable approach to to the two. First of all, figuring out if there is a real danger there, and if there is a danger, then start worrying about how you might stop the gaps and vulnerabilities. So, does that ever happen? No, it doesn't. In all of the past events or criminal terrorist events involving chemicals or biologicals, there was no at no situation where we knew either the capabilities or the intent of the leaders. So. Uh, so this is just what I said. Uh, it, if you look back at past uh, past groups, maybe if the Japanese police and the uh, intelligence people had been more suspicious, they could have figured out the capabilities of the Amshin Rikyo. Like I said, they had medical doctors, they had um, PhD physicists, they had uh, microbiologists, and they still, even though they still failed, you would think at some point that if somebody had been watching them of authority that they could have figured out these guys are really dangerous on a technical level. Um, but the intent, the, the, the man who was in charge of that, uh, he, uh, you can never read his mind. It's like reading Saddam Hussein's mind. Uh, if you only have one person that's going to make the decision and that person is either crazy or 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 so uh, bizarre that you can't figure out where that person is going to go. How can you figure out somebody's intent? Even if you have people uh, and, uh, as agents in, at the highest level. So the, I'd like to make one point here, though, that is that the Al-Qaeda has made clear, their leadership has made clear that it's their duty to acquire weapons of mass destruction. Um, and they certainly try to do so in, in the biological area, but all of this is so, such general, like I wish type of things, that it's not actionable uh, intelligence. Uh, this is, in a way, when we think of the nightmare in the bioterrorist field, we're thinking about this situation, where you had the Pakistani microbiologist, the well-trained microbiologist, who actually did work as kind of like a consultant for Al-Qaeda. And the documents, and when uh, uh, in Afghanistan there were raids some years ago, and they came up with these documents that he had then uh, sent. These were documents that were sent to the leadership of the uh, of the Al Qaeda, including this one, which has to do with setting up a microbiological laboratory. Other documents tell how he about his attempts to. Uh, to secure some cultures of bacillus and thracis. And then he also set up a way that, uh, yeah, you can see here, if you can read this, you can read this actually, this comes from um, Google, uh, um, the, uh, from just a search of, of this person's name and with a microbiologist, you can get some of these. These are heavily redacted by the intelligence community, so you don't get the whole picture. But here, his suggestion is that you set up a vaccination production unit, and that's going to shield then the biological weapons plant that uh, that he was 
proposing should be built by Al-Qaeda. So the intent is there, and, it, and I, as far as we know, the, te the technical capability is not so far. So if we can't do it, um, a dependable or really a, a what you say a real valid threat assessment. Well, what is there for us to do? And uh, the what we have right now is vulnerability studies. So everything that's being done right now in planning for uh, bioterrorist attacks has to do with uh, trying to plug gaps in our vulnerabilities. Now, uh, and one way we try to uh, also to to deal with the issue on what kind of research should we do that it's most useful for the future to, uh, to prevent bioterrorist attacks is through es expert solicitations. So an example of that was when I was uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, when the Department of Homeland Security was setting up the National Bioanalysis and uh, Assessment Center at Fort Detrick, the question was, well, what is that center's, we call it NBAC for short, and what's NBAC going to do? So they set up four uh, essentially expert groups. One was on virology, one was on bacteriology, one was on toxinology, and uh, one was on phytopathology. So I was part of the bacteriology group, and that's what we did. We just sat and we went through uh, the major uh, organisms that were th threats and, and what kind of gaps needed to be filled in order to figure out or to, to have some sort of research program for defenses like vaccines, anti, uh, for therapeutics, for detection kits and so on. The interesting part is that even though our work was held in the unclassified environment, the, class, the results of that was classified, so I've never seen the results of it. And then eventually, if there is data, maybe we can do some of the normal things that is done uh, to do risk assessments. But I don't, I'm not holding my breath for that. So when after 9-11, the insurance companies were put under tremendous pressure to come up with, uh, with insurance against terrorist attacks. So they started developing these lists of facilities uh, that were most, uh, what should we say, vulnerable to, should we say, the general, by ter or, or general terrorist attacks. So what we did at Monterey Institute is that we did something the same, but we, we then narrowed it down to by a terrorist attack. So you can argue about you know, whether this is valid or not, but this is what we came out. So you can see from this list that by far the most vulnerable to bioterrorism in the United States are, are agriculture, uh, both the animal agriculture and plant agriculture. And then a uh, little bit higher than that are prepared food outlets, like the Rajneeji, in other words. And I'm going to tell you why in a, in a minute. Uh, and then we have to worry about next about the central preparation of food, because the way our food industry mass produces food is, makes it very vulnerable. And after that, it becomes less and less uh, vulnerabilities. And again, if somebody wants to argue with me about this list and want to put something else on, I'm wonderful, I'm listening, I'm willing to listen for good ideas. So it's also very clear that it's much easier if you are a facility manager and that facility is one building, that's a hell of a lot easier to protect than if you get to to city. As, uh, as far as we're concerned, if you are a mayor of a city or a governor of a state or president of the United States, you just have to work on the assumption that that uh, jurisdiction is vulnerable to a biological attack, and now what do we do about it? So on a single, on a single even a multiple building facility, uh, these are then the major vulnerabilities, the air handling system, the water handling system, and water handling system, by the way, are not as easy as to get into as a lot of people think, because there's a lot of pressure, the water is chlorinated, and so on. I can get more into that if you're interested, I, and you can ask me about that. Uh, sabotage if there's some edible products coming into that facility, and then uh, and then you have to, and if the facility is actually manufacturing edible products, then you have to worry about the insider-outside problem, which I'm going to get to. 
And then the smallest probability, at least in the United States, maybe not in Iraq, but in the United States, is ingress by uh, outsiders. Uh, so the vulnerability studies that I've been involved with, we had this project that was pretty big where the Department of Energy came to us and they said, uh, we have $124 million to protect the national laboratories against biological attacks. How do we spend that money? Well, we put together a group of, of specialists in, in risk assessment. We, and that, I think, was the first time anybody's done that. So we had risk assessors from the insurance industry, from public health, from environmental, people that were dealing with environmental matters, from the uh, pharmaceutical industry. We had a whole bunch of really, really highly qualified, dealing with space issues. The people that were doing the risk assessment about sending uh, um, a spacecraft to Mars and maybe bringing back you know, some weird organisms from Mars. We had the ones who were dealt with that. We had those guys on our team. And uh, eventually it came down to, again, expert solicitation. That's really what we do. You, you get experts together and, uh, and uh, who, who know the facility. And, and, uh, and, and the list that I just showed you is really the list you follow for the physical parts of it. But as far as the biological part of it, then the question is really, which pathogens can terrorist or criminals acquire, and how would they use those? And that depends on expert solicitation. And that's what we gave to the Department of Energy. That article, uh, the results of that was published in a, in a foremost journal in the field called Risk Analysis. So if you're interested, I can give you the, uh, the, uh, the citation for that. So then let's discuss that exactly. What uh, are the, we know by now that the foodborne agents are the easiest to acquire, and I'm going to get back to that. So what are the sources for pathogens? Now I should mention that foodborne agents are not very popular, we think. We've never talked to anybody in the, that is a leader in the, in the terrorist organization, but we don't think they'll uh, be so interested in foodborne agents because they they generate casualties that become sick. In other words, it's just you have morbidity, uh, but you don't have mortality. And that's what, uh, what somebody like Amshirika wants. They want mortality. So, so anyway, what, where are, are criminals, pathogens, or, or terrorists going to get their pathogens? Well, it could be from the environment. There are, if you all follow ProMed, for example, uh, ProMed... It comes up with notices all the time, like there's an anthrax outbreak going on in, shall we say, in, in uh, Alberta, Canada. So conceivably somebody could go there and then collect samples from the affected cows or the burial grounds. Though in, in, case, in most developed countries, uh, the rule is to burn carcasses that, are, that have been affected by, by, by anthrax. But that's not the case, for example, in the former Soviet Union, where they had thousands of outbreaks over the years, and there they got, they just don't have the resources to, to burn cadavers. That's a, a very intense and very uh, time-consuming effort. So there there's bulldozers and hack out a big piece of a big trench in the ground and then just throw in the cadavers into that. So the possibility is that, that somebody could go and then dig up some spores from one of these trenches. But again, that depends on some expertise. You've got to be some sort of qualified environmental biotechnologist or environmental microbiologist before you can separate out the organisms that cause the anthrax from all of the other soil forms that are also uh, around. Um, another possibility is the epizootic sites, and certainly the, um, the Amshinriki try to do that. They send their operatives to Africa during an Ebola outbreak to try to get some Ebola virus. And they didn't succeed, fortunately, but that's another possibility. Um, and, well, it's an episodic, sorry, that's, we just talked about episodic. So epidemic site is the e Ebola uh, Africa, and they didn't succeed. Hospitals and clinics, as a clinical microbiologist, I can tell you that uh, most clinical and microbiology laboratories are not well guarded, and they all have incubators with pathogens sitting 
in their laboratories. And in most cases, if somebody walks into the laboratory and they have a white coat on with an impressive label that says PhD, MD, and all that, uh, nobody's going to question that person. Uh, well, I hope your, your hospital, and uh, that I'm wrong about that in your hospitals, but that certainly used to be the case. I, now, of course, there's many more uh, ways to identify people and so on, to, to exclude them. But they're still, um, they're still there, and, uh, and the Diane Thompson uh, episode shows that it could be done. That's an insider. The insider threat is, is probably the most difficult one to defend against. Culture collections, we have uh, the American Type Culture Collection and some other ones in the United States, but they are rigidly, rigidly controlled, and they have been controlled since 1993. But there is over 360 culture collections throughout the world that are sometimes controlled and often not. And the question is, who are they willing to sell cultures to? We don't know. There's a lot of pathogen culture collection out there that uh, that needs we think we need to be tightened up. Uh, former Soviet Union, we did a big study on the anti-plague system of the former Soviet Union. In the former times, they had six anti-plague um, institutes, and they had um, about 60 anti-plague stations. All of the anti-plague institutes have big culture collections of pathogens that they have been collecting since they were set up starting in the late 1800s. The one in Almaty, the, the, the Almaty, the Kazakh Anti-Plague Institute, which I've been to several times, they have over 3,000 strains of just Yersinia pestis. So uh, the, we have something called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which helps institutes in the former union uh, secure their, their, their facilities overall, including their culture collection. So that's working, but there's still a lot of those anti-plague stations out there that are completely unprotected as far as ingress by outsiders or uh, corruption from the inside. Uh, there's huge corruption, especially in Russia, well, the other ones too, and there's nothing to say. And you have scientists that work uh, in these anti-plague institutes that make $30 a month. So if you come and offer them $1,000 for a really juicy culture of the cellulose and traces. Who knows what they would say? But I think they would be tempted. And then, of course, for terrorist group, there are some uh, states that might be willing to uh, to supply them with pathogens from their own culture collections. And every country has culture collections. Uh, but we think this is unlikely because uh, most countries don't trust their own terrorists. And who knows what? Uh, these guys would do once they got their hands on some of these pathogens. So, uh, so we know that uh, the easiest pathogens to acquire are, are foodborne. Uh, the, the difficulty, the bacillus anthracis and so on, the middle group, are, are, di are rather difficult to get. And as far as the highly dangerous viruses like the phyloviruses, it's almost impossible. And we also know by now that the easiest way to, for methods to use pathogens is by contaminating food and beverages. And to, to actually create an aerosol is technically very difficult. Bruce Ivins could do it because he was a scientist who worked at, uh, at uh, US AMRIT, United States Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, where they deal with that kind of thing. So and if, and let's assume that it was him, if he had, instead of putting these spores into an envelope, had put them in a small bottle and had that bottle crushed in the subway system, the metros in, in Washington, we would have a very, very difficult matter of uh, many, many thousands of casualties and probably closing down the whole system because of the movement of the spores. The food distribution system, this was developed by Bruce Hope, who works for the... Um, Department of Health in Oregon. And essentially, what you have here is you have two tracks, uh, animal products and uh, plant products, and how that moves through. Since you have that, you know, you, uh, you can just refer to this schema uh, on your own pleasure. Now, nature can 
um, introduce a pathogen at this level, the very beginning. And that was done, for example, with the E. coli 0157H7, the one that, uh, that uh, affected the spinach and came from uh, the, uh, California, where the idea was that probably feral pigs got into the spinach field and uh, defecated, and that uh, E. coli came from that feces and then affected the spinach. And E. coli 0157, unlike many, many foodborne agents, can actually in ingress into the tissues of the plant. So it's very, very difficult to wash it off. So that makes it possible for the, for the, uh, for the pathogen to be carried out all the way through this whole processing and reach the consumer. But the cases I was telling about, the Diane Thompson and the Rajneeshi case, they, the, the, uh, the ingress was down here at the retailers. So that's pretty easy to do and pretty straightforward. There's no steps. So uh, somebody who wants to, uh, if they had a, even a far-sighted group like the Al-Qaeda group who wanted to, to sabotage our food system would really have to worry about in putting in somewhere, uh, do the sabotage somewhere along the line somewhere earlier. And this, uh, this, this was a case study involving botulinum toxin and this shows now a tremendous weakness of our system for food distribution. So what it shows is that there's a whole bunch of sources for the food product. And of course there's a whole bunch of cons and consumers. So all of this, in this case it's, it's uh, milk we're talking about that's being contaminated by botulinum neurotoxin. So there's 64,000 cows um, but that, the milk from that is gathered and, it's, uh, and that it's gathered and, and collected in by in at, at 80 farm tanks. And from there, it's transported in 5,500 um, gallon trucks that takes them to silos, milk silos. And then from the silos, it goes into the uh, processing line, the two processing lines, and then into the finished processing uh, facility uh, where they actually, for example, in our case, they pasteurize and then they bottle the milk. Now, we're talking about botulinum toxin. If somebody introduced botulinum toxin along here, that probably would mostly be uh, destroyed here at the pasteurization. We pasteurize, typically we pasteurize milk at 161 degrees for 15 minutes. That, that, that destroys about somewhere between around 90% around of botulinum toxin. In Europe, uh, they, uh, they, um, they have a higher temperature, uh, which we don't accept because we think it affects the taste. They, they go up about 100, 172 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and that would, produce, that would almost eliminate like 99% of the botulinum neurotoxin. Uh, so if there's somebody that's affected here, you can be pretty sure if you're investigating the event that it happened somewhere after, uh, well, at the point where the milk is being bottled, the botulinum toxin is, is, is being introduced. And it probably is not going to happen here because, whoops, because once because once the the, this product is in a bottle, then it's kind of difficult to open and start and individually start sabotaging them. Now, the, the spinach situation is different because it could happen anywhere here and it would survive. And so if you had a spinach outbreak here, imagining being the investigator and trying to go through all of this all the way back here. Very, very difficult process. Um, so, anyway, something to think about. Now, we do have scenarios. Uh, I have written an article on, uh, on counterfeit botulinum toxin and the threats that are generated by the producers of that kind of toxin. And, uh, and the, uh, so we didn't publish the scenarios, but believe me, there are scenarios where you have operatives moving along here, and you can, if they have botulinum toxin, they can uh, generate thousands of casualties. 
So these are the, I'm not going to go through this, I think most of you know, these are the significant pathogens that we have to worry about. Uh, the virus, uh, the two first, are the most common for natural outbreaks, but as far as we can see, there's no threat of anybody using these, uh, these kind of organisms for sabotage purposes. There's some threat, we think, especially from the cryptosporidiosis. I mean, but that would be difficult for a bioterrorist to actually start raising the quantities of, of uh, parasites that are needed and then getting them into it. This episode was very interesting. I think maybe you remember 1993. Look at this, how many people were affected by, by, uh, by, by this cryptosporidiosis. And that had to do with, with uh, a very old water handling system where the, that allowed waste to be mixed with drinking water. And, and you got 400, as you can see, 403,000 cases. Now, they, I don't, can't imagine that any terrorist being or saboteur being able to do anything like that. Nature is really wonderful in these ways. And then the, uh, the, we worry about toxins. Botulinum toxin is the only one we worry about really for producing mass casualties because it is so toxic. I mean, it's so very toxic. If, if for example, we could buy um, um, a one-tenth of a gram of botulinum toxin from an illegal producer in China, which apparently, if, if you believe their advertising is on the internet, that we can do that. But if we get one-tenth of a gram of, of uh, botulinum toxin, we're talking about being able to kill, theoretically kill, tens of thousands of people. And these other ones, though, for smaller use, I mean, these are all pretty available. We have lots and lots of, uh, of, uh, of mushrooms. Oleandrum is a beautiful plant that grows in the middle of the freeways, you know, separates the, uh, the, the lanes. Uh, and, of course, ricin, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, I don't know what trips my mind, the, uh, the plants that produce the, uh, it just slipped my mind right now, but they're, they're all over California, probably here too. Uh, so I think I'm starting to run short of time. So uh, when you look at that chart that I shared, the first one by, by, uh, by Bob Hope, it has, it tells you there's two, way, two types of uh, sabotage that can be done. One is sabotage of the nodes. That's actually where something is being done to the food. It's being mixed, it's being cooked, something's being done to it. And then they are the communication lines. So the nodes are the ones that we worry about. And these are then, you can read this in, in, uh, in that PDF that's in your DVD. And uh, the, the, the thing that we worry most about is insider. People in the food industry don't take their security as, as, uh, as serious as people would do in the research and, uh, should I say, community, uh, especially when they're working with pathogens. But uh, the, it's incredibly how really the, the, the vulnerability of our food industry is really incredibly high. And it's also amazing how little our government puts into uh, securing that food supply. So, for example, there's, I, I think the last count was there were only 300 uh, USDA inspectors that uh, checked on foods that were being imported from Central America and from, and from uh, South America and so on. And that's incredible. And less than 5% of all food products is, is sampled and analyzed. So uh, this, is, this is just, to me, a disaster waiting to happen. So I'm not going to go into the links. You can read that. So to really uh, improve our ability to, to, to deal with the terrorist threat, uh, first of all, we have to improve our human intelligence. Now, this is something that we can't measure because it's all classified information. But it used to be, uh, even a few years ago, that intelligence community had hardly anybody that knew anything about the biosciences. And I understand, I know that they are because uh, they are recruiting many, many more people because some of my friends have been recruited. And so they're very serious about that. 
but I think we're still way behind uh, as far as getting the right people into the intelligence and police communities that deal with not only biological but also chemical intent e events. And then um, this whole issue about dual use knowledge and equipment, uh, this is an issue that we can spend hours on here, uh, but the question always is, thanks, the question always is whether or not we should put hinders on the publication of what we consider or what we can think of sensitive information, um, but would that then hinder our research community in, in uh, publishing information that might be used to defend our interests? So the virus spectrum right now anyway is this, that this is the biggest threat right here. And it, you all know about emerging infectious diseases and, trans, and also imported infectious diseases. And it happens all the time. H1N1 is only the latest example of a re-emerging disease. And SARS, I mean, there's a lot of that. So certainly we're going to have that. We haven't had any misuse of dual-use technologies that we know, but uh, we can maybe with the maybe with the, with the exception of Ivan's, if he is the one who was guilty. We don't know about biological terrorism, even though we have put in $20 billion, more than $20 billion, on defending our country against bioterrorism since 1996, when my President Clinton administration started this. Uh, we don't know if there's a real threat out there. But the beautiful part of this, as far as I'm concerned, before 1996, our public health system at both the federal and at the local levels was in an abhorrent state. We, our ability to detect diseases and follow and monitor was really poor. So because of all this money that's gone into biological terrorism, we are much, much better able to meet the, the real threats, which is, to me is this threat right here. So I'm all for all that money going into it. You can argue with me about that, by the way, if you want to. So in the future, what are we worried about? Well, nature again. Who knows what nature has in store for us? It's, uh, it's, it's waiting for us. Is H5N1 going to be transmissible between people? I mean, that's a big issue right now, I think, in the, in the infectious disease field. National planning scenario. Uh, developed by the Homeland Security Council has this on their list. And uh, so you can still see that, that uh, the, the threats here, pandemic influenza, but it still has aerosol, anthrax, terrorist. It still has plague, which I think is pretty ridiculous because Yersinia pestis is really difficult to deal with. You know, it's an organism that's very, very fragile. So, and... People call up and said, we're developing an exercise and we want to disperse a lot of Yersinia pestis. Wow, well, how are you going to do that? You're not going to disperse a bunch of fleas. I mean, and, and you try to aerosol, try, try an aerosol formulation. The Soviets worked years on getting a successful aerosol uh, uh, formulated Yersinia pestis formulation that, that worked, that, that could keep it alive for 20 minutes. So... So, uh, I, you know, to me, that's a list. And then, uh, uh, but what is on the list here, food contamination, I agree with. But what I think we should worry about most is this. It has nothing to do with bioterrorism. The, it reads, a backpack found along the route of Martin Luther King Day Parade, Monday, January 17, 2010, in Spokane, Washington. The bag contained a sophisticated explosive and a remote detonator. It had the ability to cause many casualties. It was sighted on the steel bench with a brick wall behind it so the shrapnel would be directed towards the parade. I mean, we are just waiting for the first time that a suicide bomber walks through Grand Central Station with one of these backpacks on it. And that's going to change our lives forever. If you think the security measures that we have now in airports and so on are going to be stringent, just wait till that happens. That, to me, is a real threat. Much, well, don't have to go into that. And this is another one. We have every day 
We had thousands of trucks and railroad cars going through our city, cities with toxic material. Accidents happen all the time with these things. And we also have facilities close to cities or even in cities that are dealing with all kinds of toxic material. So this is just waiting to happen. For a terrorist to, this would be the easiest way, I think, for, mass, for a terrorist to produce mass casualties is to find out about some of these shipping lines and, and, and blow up a, a carload full of anhydrous ammonia or chlorine or cyanide. And that is, happens every day these things pass through our cities. We had an exercise in, in, uh, in Salinas. Salinas is, produces, well, huge produce producer in a way, you know that. Uh, 60% of all the spinach is produced in Salinas Valley for the United States. And what do they use for chilling this? What they do is that the pickers pick the spinach in the field. Within two hours, that spinach is out in these big hangers. The, and the temperature is brought down to three degrees centigrade because fresh spinach is got to be cold. And then it goes through the, through, sorry, through the, uh, the, the washing line. Okay. So we found out, what do they use for the, for, to chill the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the spinach? It is a heat exchange system based on hydrous ammonia. There's hundreds and hundreds of tons of hydrous ammonia everywhere in Salinas. So we had an exercise based on that. That's it. Questions? No question. Yeah. Yeah, no, they are all remnants from a an, an long-concluded chemical weapons program. So under, under the Chemical Weapons Convention, we have agreed to get rid of all of our chemical weapons by 2012. However, because of a lot of political reasons, mostly having to do with, with people in, uh, at, at sites or near sites saying that can happen in ours or, or some... And there have been uh, Greenpeace, for example, said that, the, that incinerating chemical weapons agents is not the way to go, or there should be other ways. So there's been a lot of resistance about that. Uh, so there's been held up. So now the idea is going to be, uh, right now, about 70% of all old chemical weapons have been destroyed. So the ones that are out in areas like that, it's the ones that are probably the most safely stored and that we can wait with and that, uh, that are going to be destroyed. Now the target is 2020, that 100% of all our chemical weapons are going to be gone. And I think that's going to happen. That's happening all over the place. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, the question was whether or not the Soviet Union had lots of remnants of biological weapons uh, when the Soviet Union broke up in uh, December 1991. Well, th they didn't. Uh, they had some. They had about 200 tons of uh, bacillus and thresis, uh, spores in a slurry that they took to Vosrozdini Island and they, 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 they decontaminated and buried it. But most, what they had mostly were these giant... Um, mobilizations, what they call mobilization stations. And the mobilization were stations were factories that were set up to be activated in case of war. So within six weeks of the Soviet Union thinking they're going to go to war with NATO or with China, they would have these uh, mobilization plants churning out tons and tons and tons of, uh, of uh, biological weapons agents of all kinds. So they really didn't need to store them. They had these mobilization plants, which have mostly been destroyed by now. Yeah. Okay. So. 
Thank you very much.